Thank you, sir. Thank you. God is good all the time. Oh, I didn't know we were there. Oh, we got Pentecostal. All right. I'm going to take it back 20, 20, 30 years. Okay. Um, so it's been great to witness um, what's been happening here over the past few few months. Um, since the last, well, I was, I was here Father's Day, wasn't I? Um, June 16th. And great. You know, I'm always watching the socials. Um, slight bit of jealousy because you guys, your social team is just like incredible. Um, <laughs> but, you know, God is still working on me. So we will get that jealousy out. But um, no, it's, it's good. No, you guys are great. It's good to see um, uh, others stepping up into the pulpit, sharing. Um, sis, Tony, and, and Leke. Yeah, man. That's it, man. That's my retirement plan. Start early. No, um, it's good because, you know, the Lord has gifted so many individuals. And sometimes we sit, I know I was like that. I was sitting in the, um, in the pews going, yeah, but I see these things and I just need someone just to bring me out. Uh, funny enough, Pastor Io was one of those individuals who said to me, I mean, you know, you got something, right? Yeah, yeah, but you know, we're at Box Park Croydon. I'll tell you the story. We're at Box Park Croydon. 20, it was before the pandemic, wasn't it? Yeah, 2018, 2019. And we just started talking and we realized that we both were seeing the same things, hearing the same things from the Lord. And he just encouraged me to start doing it a bit, a little bit more serious. Um, gave me an opportunity and now my life has been changed forever more and whatnot. So brilliant man, as we know. Um, it's interesting because I use all his photos for my promo stuff. So that's also the, the double benefit of having him as a friend. Get some good promo shots. Um, I know in their absence, when he asked me to share today, I had a few things running around my heart. And I was like, Lord, it's like I had this half, I thought it was a half cooked sermon, the highest calling, which I know you guys now know, I should, it got sent out. I was like, Lord, why is there nothing more coming? And I like had this moment well, I thought, I've been sharing with you guys for now, like five, four or five years. And I know I kind of stick around the same kind of themes of proximity, intimacy, friendship with God, whatever the case may be. But what I didn't want to do is, is take the liberty of rushing ahead or keep going on that theme and assuming that everyone understands and everyone is au fait with everything we're discussing because new people join the church. Or sometimes it takes a while to sometimes grapple with some of these ideas or assimilate them into our lives i know that from my own experience i still find out things in the scripture and i go wow even scriptures that i use in my sermons three years later i'm like lord if you told me that three years ago that sermon would have been even better you know i, mean, I could have used that before um so it's I, I wanted to take a moment to pause and then Pastor Ayo said to me, I said, oh, you know, what are you guys doing in the summer? And he gave me that Proverbs 10, 5, talk about, you know, in the, in the summer you gather. And I said, yeah, that's what we want to do. So we want to use this opportunity today. And that's why, you know, it's very, to be honest, it's very unusual for me to have my notes in any sort of order that early in the week. It's usually Saturday, Sunday morning. I kind of start putting it together. It's in my head, but like, I'm not really great at writing things down in logical order. Um, I actually had to really write it out so people understood it. I used to put words and little quotes and things that I understand. But I thought to myself, let me send out what I have so you guys can do some pre-reading if you wanted to. You don't have to. There was no condemnation. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up if you read it. <laughs> but it was an opportunity for you guys to see what we were going to look at. So we can come together on these themes. So it wasn't necessarily revelation, but it was confirmation of information that you guys can dig into in your own time. And then, you know, do a bit of Q&A to end. And, you know, I've seen some of the questions that have come in. Some really juicy ones, man. You look, don't do things by halves. That's going to be good to, to just look at those questions. And if we get time for more live questions can come in, I think we've got facility to do that, right? So, good. so we can just really just look at and take a time to pause and gather ourselves around these ideas that I've been sharing over the past four years or so. 
So again, so the title is The Highest Calling. Um, I want to start with a quote that I, I've heard a few times this, this week from um, a pastor out in America, Michael Kalianos. Many of you are probably familiar with him in Jesus' image, um, the, the, the church out in Orlando. And he said this, and it's really incredible. He said this years ago, but it came back on my feed um, on YouTube this week when I was just looking for one of his sermons. He said, your presence at church is not evidence of your salvation. His abiding presence in your life is. Now, I, I when I hear things like that, I'm like, <sighs> and he started talking about, you know, it's not you being on the worship team that is evidence that you're saved. It's not what you do for God that is evidence of your salvation. It is his abiding presence. And we're going to look at some ideas around what I believe is the highest calling in scripture. I believe that Jesus, when he began to speak, um, in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, in that final discourse with his disciples before he got arrested and went obviously to the cross and resurrected. That for me is like the crescendo of his ministry. All the three and a half years were leading up to that one conversation, right? Having studied those chapters for the past 10 years or so, there were so many gems in there that even, and I'm preaching next week in my church, I'm going to preach on John 17, and I'm still finding out new things. Like I said, it's like you go into it and you're like, wow, I wish I knew this before. So the first thing that we looked, that I, I sent over um, was John 15. Okay. And it, it, it's a statement we've heard and it's, it's something that we, we know. Um, and again, guys, when we go into like a bit more of an open time, what I want, if you've read over my notes and you had something that you saw in the scriptures, oh, you know what? When I read John 15, I thought this, and, you know, please feel free to help edify the believers because like I said there's more preachers in the room than just the three of us you know one two three I see you so John 15 15 so like I said contextually um, and it's always good to read these scriptures in context so you need to know when these things are happening what Jesus is doing, why he's doing it, um, because everything is intentional, okay? There's nothing by accident. I was, even down to the grammar and punctuation, I know that obviously came later, you know, grammar and punctuation, but I believe even the way sometimes the scriptures are put together in that way, why does, you know, scripture use the word like nevertheless or however, or, you know, just things like that. So, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. They've been with him for, like I said, three and a half years now. And this is final conversation. I believe it, it starts a few chapters earlier and it says, Jesus knowing what was about to happen. So he knew he was about to be arrested. So he knew. So like I said, this is, this, you know, you're about to be arrested. You, you're about to go to the cross. It's your final opportunity to tell them the things that are on your heart. I believe that when Jesus was speaking, he knew this was a crucial moment. And so he was giving them the good stuff, right? This is stuff he had in his back pocket. This is it. This is clutch moment, right? Steph Curry, if anyone watched the basketball last night, right? Steph Curry, fourth quarter, two minutes to go. You know, you're up by three. I just need you to put the game away, okay? Some of you are like, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> you'll get it. Watch the highlights, you'll get it. So this is the final bit before you go to the cross, okay? Final chance to talk to all 12. Judas is in this conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, Judas. Remember, Judas went out and healed the sick, right? Y'all know that. He wasn't evil all the time. That's a whole nother sermon. Let me not go there. And Jesus says this. I do not call you servants any longer. And, but look at why. He says, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends. Because I have revealed to you everything I have heard from the Father. That's crazy, y'all. Imagine being, I don't know how old um, Peter and James and, and the men them were. But imagine hearing this rabbi, this esteemed rabbi that you've seen for three and a half years, walk on water, calm the wind and waves, and he says to you, everything I've heard from Abba Father, I've shared with you. 
Like, there was nothing missing. You've heard everything. Now we know the book of John ends with an incredible statement. John says, he says, there are not enough books in the world for me to tell you everything that we saw Jesus do. So we've got this, we've got four books detailing. And then we've got Paul who met, who had an encounter with Jesus and Jesus taught him some stuff. But there were not enough books. Like John's like, guys, I'm giving you the highlights. I'm giving you the insta Do you know what I mean? Like, this is what I can, I can give you. And actually John was the last, um, they believe John was the last book to be written. Yeah, we can go there. You guys can take this. It's good meat, right? Me and veg, good stuff. It's not not child's play no more. John was the last. It was the last book to be written. They believe, um, and it was like almost because he lived like to like eighty and one hundred. So all the disciples have been pretty much killed or had passed away by that point. The first few gospels have been written. And it's interesting. John now seeing all this stuff. He had his own disciples, so like he had um. I think his name was Ignatius. A few others had started to come up under him. And what many scholars believe is that they came to him and said, yeah, but we want to know your perspective. We hear what Matthew said, Mark and Luke. But what about you? What's your perspective? And John was looking in, in AD 100, whatever it was, and he's looking at how the church was going in a particular direction. And he was like, we may need to get it back on the correct terms. Which is why his book is so completely different to the other three. So he starts with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. And he starts with this affirmation of Christ in his eternal being. And he never references himself as John. He always says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he paints this picture throughout all of his book of this circle of love between rabbi and disciple and then he, he puts all this all this stuff here is not in any of the other books this discourse right speaks about how you can enter into the secrets of the father how do you do that you lay your head upon his breast how do we know that because when um <laughs> the scripture says that when um jesus said that one of you here is going to betray me and they were like who and he didn't, he didn't tell them who. And then Peter turned to the disciple whom Jesus loved and said, ask him for us. Because obviously, you know, Peter cheats on his lambs. So Peter, zeal, Peter always represents zeal. Zeal turned to love and said, ask him for us. And love went up to the father and got the answer. So love laid his head upon his breast and said, have I, who? And he said, the one to whom I give this bread. And he gave him the piece of bread. Because zeal gets you so far, but love gets you right up close. So this whole discourse, this whole book, this one's my favorite, this is my favorite one, man. This whole book is based from the position of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, and he begins to give you this discourse about friendship, and he says the shift has occurred. You've shifted from servanthood, Old Testament, to friendship, because everything the Father has revealed, I've now given to you. There is nothing missing. How many of us live our lives with that reality? Or do we still act as if there's mysteries that, ah, oh, well, maybe. Maybe I'll find out when I get to heaven. Maybe we've heard that scripture. I think, you know, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Yeah, one can only, you sang that song? Some of you are like, one who? Now I need to check the tapes. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has conceived for those who love him. Yeah, we've heard that scripture before. Has anyone... I think I know I've said it here before. Anyone know the scripture after? It says, but it has been revealed to us by his spirit. Now in church, 
for the past thousand and forty years or so, classic Pentecostalism teaches you no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither does it, won't be able to comprehend what God has in store for you. And so we stop here at servanthood. I will never know what the master has. Friendship goes into the next one I said, but it's been revealed to me by the spirit. So all I've got to do is just ask the spirit and wait and I'll find out. So when I'm sitting there and I get a little pain in my left shoulder, I go, oh, that's weird. That's just come out of nowhere. Lord, what do I do with this? Just release it. And then servanthood says, yeah, but what if I do that and no one responds? Because servanthood wants to be judged by performance-based metrics. I need someone to put their hand up and say, yeah, that's me. Oh, great. I've got it right. Friendship says obey. Friendship says, it may be in 10 years' time, there's a comment on the YouTube that says, oh, my shoulder was, I woke up with a bad. I don't even need to see the comment. I actually, I've given up caring. I know what I felt. Because I laid my head upon his breast. That's it. It's that simple. That's what friendship is. So this shift from servant-based intimacy to friendship is one of the most transformative in all of scripture. And I find it interesting, is, you know, the fact that Jesus waits until his final address to his disciples to begin to expound on what this may look like. And I think that's significant because what he's able to do is put into context the past three and a half years. So he said, you've walked to me for three and a half years. Let me just explain what that was. That was friendship. You may have seen it through the lens of servanthood because you're, you're coming from an Old Testament, Judaic, uh, or, sorry, Hebraic. Um, perspective which is why they ask questions like okay whose sin caused that blindness they, they ask those type of questions who's going to sit at your right hand when you ascend to power what is greatness they ask all those type of questions you, you see it's all listed throughout the scripture through the narrative of the disciples these performance based questions and every time Jesus would go oh poor chaps and he'd reassign and redefine what, what greatness looked like or what, what importance looked like or what servitude looked like. Even in the, in the, um, in the last supper, in this, in this passage, in these chapters, he goes to wash their feet and Peter goes, hey, I should be washing yours. It's like, dude, you don't even get it. Servanthood, yes, you should be washing mine. I'm the rabbi. Friendship, let me serve you. And then Peter tries to be even super smart again, zeal. Well, if you're going to wash my feet, wash them all of me. Listen, sometimes I feel like, I can say this, right? Sometimes Jesus, he has a little bit of um, Afro-Caribbean in him. And in some passages I read it through that lens. Read it out, New Testament grace. And in that moment, I feel like Jesus was like, sickle. Just... Bro, just suckle. <laughs> suckle yourself. Watch all of me. Just, just suckle yourself. You know how he did it? He said, by the time the cock closed tonight, you're going to be denying me. I put him in this place. Me, me, me. Anyway. So he begins to, and he's reframed what the past three and a half years was all about. Wow, I didn't know it was that deep. I didn't know that's what you were showing us. So when, when at night time you were, you said this and said that, all the stuff that's not even in the books, and you said this about that, and you said this about that, and you taught us about this person and that person, you showed us what Elijah was really like, and Moses, and you talked about David and his heart, and all those conversations when we were walking from Capernaum to Dan or wherever they were going. You mean all those times we were talking, that was you were reading everything in the Father. Yeah, nothing has been missing. Nothing is, I withheld nothing from you. Do you know how powerful that statement is? I, Jesus, have withheld nothing from you. A and T, Jesus has withheld nothing from you. He has withheld nothing from you. So that is what it means to be a friend. 
what is the desire of God? It's interesting because I, I, I had never seen this passage in Hosea 2 before I started studying this and the highest calling. This, this, when I wrote this a few months ago, not knowing I was going to share it today, it was just a sermon that I, I started putting together, um, as, as I do. The Lord said to me, he said, what is my desire? You know, I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> um, and he, he, I don't know how I found this, this scripture, Hosea 2, 14 to 23. Like, you read it and it's like, whoa. So much to unpack in these verses. All right, we're going to go through it as quick as possible so we can get to this Q&A or whatnot. Verse 14, therefore behold, I will allure Israel. Check the language that's used. For those of you who are poets, linguists, whatever. I will allure Israel. And bring her into the wilderness. Oh, that's the first thing. Wilderness. You know that place that we always fear? That, that we were taught in church that we shouldn't be in? That if you're in the wilderness, come out! <laughs> y- y'all remember that, yeah? That's what, listen. We're family. We can... That place. This is God talking. He says, I will bring her into the wilderness. Interesting. We'll get back to that. And I will speak tenderly to her and reconcile her to me. Where does he speak tenderly to her? In the wilderness. Where, so, oh, oh, hold on. So if I want to, if I want God to speak tenderly to me, I might have to be in the wilderness. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Some of you just went, ah, that makes sense. That's by 2024. (laughs) But what happens? Then I will give her her vineyards from there. See, wilderness, when you get a creator into a wilderness, they don't stay as a wilderness. Some of you are looking, I'm, I'm in the wilderness, take me to the land full of milk and honey. No, in the wilderness is where the vineyards are. What's more of a miracle? That you went from the wilderness to the land filled with milk and honey or that the wilderness itself became an oasis. Let's consider that. And make the valley of Achor, let's go with that, a door of hope and expectation, anticipating the time when I restore my favor on her. And she will sing there and respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. It shall come about in that day, says the Lord, that she that you will call me Ishi, my husband, and you will no longer call me Bali, my Baal, for I will remove the names of the bales from her mouth so that they will no longer be mentioned or remembered by their names. And in that day, I will make a covenant for Israel with the animals of the open country and with the birds of the heavens and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the, uh, the bow and the sword and banish war from the land. And I will make them lie down in safety. And I will betroth you, Israel, to me forever. Yes, just in case you didn't get it the first time, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and loyalty and in compassion. I will betroth you. This is the third time you said that word. I will betroth you to me in stability and in faithfulness. Then you will know, recognize and appreciate the Lord and respond with love and faithfulness. It will come about in that day that I will respond, says the Lord. I will respond to the heavens which ask for rain to pour on the earth, and they will respond to the earth which begs for the rain. And the earth shall respond to the grain and the new wine and the oil which beg it to bring them forth. And they will respond to Israel, my Israel, who will now be restored. I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have mercy on her who have not obtained mercy. I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. That reminds me of some marriage vows. That's what that sounds like. That transition there in um, from barley to ishi. The word barley, you can study out, means master. The old word for master or lord. Okay, So every time you see, because sometimes it used to throw me as a kid. Because I thought, anytime time you saw the word bail or baal, it was like a bad thing because the, the foreign nations, they worship Baal and we worship Yahweh. And then sometimes you're like, and the, and the Israelites named the place Baal Perizim. 
I thought we weren't supposed to use that word. Well, it basically it means Lord, okay? So they basically, Baal or Baal, I don't know how to pronounce it, was just a word for any of the gods of the other nations, but it was also just a word for Lord, okay? I think Baal parents him is the Lord who breaks through, breaks up. So you often see, especially in the prophetic language, in Isaiah and whatnot, that that word is used. But from from Yahweh's perspective, he will say, he said, I will be your Baal, I will be your Lord. Okay, but here he's saying, You will no longer call me Lord, you'll call me husband. This is in Hosea. He says, It's going to be a time when you're, I'm going to bring you into a wilderness, and in that wilderness, I'm going to transition you from servanthood to marriage. Let's not run from the wilderness because we go from servanthood to marriage. I know which one I would prefer. But it means I've got to be in the wilderness. Because that's where it takes place. Because the wilderness is the place of the Lord's jealousy. Because it's the place where you're by yourself. We know this because in Matthew 4, after Jesus has been baptised, and he comes out, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, the Bible says, verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, and the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It was the verse that transformed my opinion of the wilderness. And I had to ask the Lord forgiveness for all the isms and schisms in my head I had about the wilderness. Because for decades, when I grew up in church, for decades I thought that the wilderness was a place to be feared. Like I said, I know I made the joke earlier, but I was taught, you know, how many altar calls have you heard? If you're in the wilderness season, that's usually the word they give in it, wilderness season. If you're in the wilderness season, come forward. And everyone comes forward and gets prayer for a wilderness season. God's like, hey, 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 I ain't finished. You ain't got your vineyard yet. And if you ain't got a vineyard, you won't have wine. How can I marry you if you're amongst the many? I need you to call, be called out. Why does it take place in the wilderness? There's a thing that the gardeners and, and those who are green fingered talk about called rewilding. Okay. The process of rewilding, I'm not green fingered at all, but I, I learned this. Rewilding is when you take something that has been like domesticated or like a plant or whatever that's been in the house and you replant it in its natural environment and you leave it and or you cultivate it in that natural environment so that it begins to in, exhibit its natural um characteristics they do it with animals so for instance a lion in a zoo will only walk a certain you know distance because it's been taught go so far no further so you need to rewild the lion you can't just plunk that lion back in the safari or you know out wild and it will then it will still only walk a certain amount of square feet because it's been taught for so long that's the only way it can go. The Lord brings us into the wilderness to rewild us. That's why he said to Moses, he said, it's what he said to him. He didn't say, go to Pharaoh, tell them, let my people go to take them to the promised land. He didn't say that. If you read the scripture, the instruction was, let my people go that they may come to the mountain to worship me. Because the first part of the process was to rewild. I've got to get them back into my presence so I can take them from the land of Egypt where there were many gods, many Baals, many lords, and I can remarry them and I can reestablish this connection. So in Exodus 19, when he shows up on the mountain with all the storms and the lightning, that was him saying, here's Yahweh. You haven't seen me, you haven't maybe heard from me in 400 of years. Generations and generations of silence, perceived silence. He never really stops talking. But here I am. And how I know that they weren't rewilded yet? They shrank back in fear. Which is why it took 40 years for them to walk around. Not because they couldn't have done it quicker, but because it took 40 years to get Egypt out. And the Bible says that the generation that entered into uh, the promised land was a generation who never knew Egypt. 
Because when they showed up to Egypt the first time, they went, <gasps> giants. When they showed up to Egypt the second time, they went, how many times have we got to walk around? All right, cool. Let's do it. Because they've been rewilded to trust him, to obey. Because they'd finally learned who Yahweh was. That's why I don't fear the wilderness. Actually, I quite enjoy it. There's been moments where I've craved it. Trust me, I'll ask your pastor. I've messaged him sometimes and said, I'm getting all this attention, I don't want it. Take me back to when no one knew who I was. Take me back to when no one was asking me to preach. Take me back to when it was just a little bit quieter. Or I'm not sure how I'm going to cope with when it gets busy because what I have now is so precious. I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's just me and him and I'm, I'm quite happy here. And it's just me and my lover. I don't know how I'm going to cope when there's thousands because I can see it coming around the corner and I'm not sure if I'm ready for that crossover. Trust me, we've had those conversations. An apostle and Pastor Alan, we have those talks because it's real. This is nice. This is comfortable. But there's an aspect where I'm like, okay, take me home. And just get me back to this one-on-one. Because I've had that wilderness moment. And I've learned what it meant to leave the revelation of him as Lord and find him as issue. And it's interesting because from verse, actually from verse 18, he talks about he's going to make a covenant it says, I will abolish war from the land. The first thing that comes at a revelation of marriage is peace. So I'm going to take war out of your story. Take chaos out of your story. I'm going to take drama out of your story. I'm going to bring peace. And then as he's talking about betrothing, 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 and he says from verse 21 onwards, Fruitfulness. But notice, he says, verse 21 says, I will respond to the heavens which ask for rain, they'll respond to the earth which begs for rain. So the conditions were already set. All it needed was covenant to walk into the room. I'm going to say that again because we don't missed it. The conditions were already set. The heavens already have the rain to provide. The earth is waiting for the rain. All it needs is someone to walk in who has a covenant and then all of a sudden that transfer occurs between heaven and earth. And then you have fruitfulness and the earth yields itself. And there's oil, there's fruit. As it was in the time of Adam, the Bible says that the earth yielded of itself. Right? Romans 8, is it, where it talks about um, all of all creation is waiting the manifestation of the sons of God. I pray that prayer, I, I confess that scripture so many times. You know, I, I do my walks <coughs> in the morning when I'm walking, especially when I'm walking through the park or whatever, that's a common prayer that I would pray. Like every blade of grass is waiting for me. And this is more blessed now as I walk past than ever before. Because I am a son. Covenant has walked into this park and now it is more alive. It's responding to my presence here because Yahweh is here and it rejoices at the advance. It rejoices at my approach. The earth knows I'm coming. Storms get turned away. Ever tried that? I tried it. This is 2000 and what year was I in? Was that, was that uni? I can't remember what year it was. And um, I left my house. I was in Birmingham at the time. Um, if you know anything about Birmingham, it can rain like no other city. But it will rain without warning. And true to form, it just started to rain. Boom. 
was like, oh. It took me, it took me half an hour to walk to uni. So yeah, that means that must have been my first year. Yeah. Where I was living, it took me half an hour to walk there. I remember, because I just knew the scripture, all creations were from the manifestation of the Son of God. I was like, well, Joshua caused the sun to stay in the sky, and he had the old covenant. Like, Elijah was doing chariots of fire stuff, old covenant. I was like, I'm going to be soaking wet by the time I get to the lecture. Half an hour. I said, Lord, please cause this rain to stop until I get to uni. That's what I said. The rain stopped. I was like, okay, cool. So I started walking. The reason why I believe it was confirmation of my prayer is because, say this, this, um, these lights here are the entrance to my uni. I literally went like this. As I walked through the entrance, I went, <sighs> and that's the time I realized it's not just the rain stopped. It started at the point of time because covenant had made a declaration. I do it in parking spaces. I learned that from my mum. I used to, yeah, yeah, I used to be in the car with my mum and we were going to, going out shopping or whatever. It was just, I'm just giving you the practical stuff. Because sometimes we over spiritualize it. It's not just about healing the sick, sometimes about getting parking spaces. And she would be like, Holy Spirit, I need a parking space. I need to be in and out in 10 minutes. And literally, I've seen it happen so many times. This is when I was a kid. She would literally turn into the car park and on the first floor, a parking someone's pulling out. Thank you. And she would say, thank you, Holy Spirit. So when I started driving, I said, let me try this thing. <laughs> okay, all right. A couple of times I'd be like, I need a parking space. And it works. Try it. All the time on ways, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm running late on this traffic. And he'll be like, what time do you want to get there? Say so it says like 10.42. I'm like, can we get to 10.37? Okay. And all of a sudden, he just starts, I don't know what happens. And it just comes down 37 on the dot. Or the other times when it still says 42, but I arrive at 37. And I'm like, and he just chuckles. They said, no, I have seen. The reward of intimacy is fruitfulness because the heavens and the earth are waiting. They're, they're pregnant with rain. All they need is someone to walk in and just say, you release, you receive. That's all it is. And when you pray, when you say, I'm giving you the power that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. If you actually study it out, it's actually whatsoever is already loose in heaven, you will loose on earth. There's things that are just established in heaven. Healing is established in heaven. So all I'm doing is, is commanding a, a tight shoulder to come into agreement with something that is already established in heaven. The last scripture that I put in the notes, James 4, 5 to 6, it was in the Passion Translation. It says here, does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? Verse six, but he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. There is a grace poured out on us or to walk in the desired intimacy with the Spirit. I love this idea that 
It's like, the spirit inside is jealous. I love that. I love the fact that there's a jealousy. You know? I'm not going to go there. I love the fact that there's a jealousy. Because all of us that have ever been in love, we want to be, we want to be desired. We want to be wanted. We want our partner, our spouse, to express that sense of you're the one and only and I want you to know that. That I will fight tooth and nail, or hand and nail, foot and nail for you. That's what he did. And he expressed that and then he gives us his Holy Spirit and places him on the inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is jealous for anything that will take you away from that place of intimacy. Some interpretation in the scripture even talk about how the Father himself is jealous for the fact that the Spirit lives on the inside of you. It's like, I wish I could be back to that. But he knows that one day you'll come home and we'll have back into perfection. But I love this. this he's a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us. So there was a point where he didn't have your finances and then he gave it to him and said, thank you. But now I want that relationship with your mother. And I'll wait patiently and patiently and patiently until you give that to me. And then when you give it to me, I say, thank you. But, but now on your, your work situation, we're going to talk about that. And then you give that to him and say, okay, cool, cool. Now I want your health. Can you trust me with your health? Because I love you so much. I just want more and more. I know we dealt with three things. It's taken us 10 years to get to this point. But it's okay. I'm patient. My loving kindness, my mercy is new every day. But I'm not going to stop until I overwhelm and overflow. Consider Mary and Martha. The simplicity of Mary, you know the story of Mary and Martha when Mary sat at Jesus' feet and Martha went and cooked him a meal when he wasn't hungry. Right? Consider that story the simplicity of Mary's intimacy exposes Martha's idolatry. The simplicity of Mary's intimacy exposes Martha's idolatry. You'll find this in your own life. When you find the simplicity of intimacy, people around you, you'll start to realize how much idolatry is around. Like, oh, okay. It doesn't need to be like that. It doesn't need to be that. Nah, it doesn't need to, it's not that deep. Church is not that complicated. The Christian life is not that complicated. We did so well at making it so complicated. We put all these hurdles in and we call it religion. The simplicity of Mary's intimacy exposes Martha's idolatry. Bill Johnson says this, some things that we hunger for, we have insulated ourselves from. We've set ourselves up so well for our own comfort that we don't have access to what we ask for. Again, it's that running away from places that we call the wilderness. But one thing I do know is that conquered ones are the ones that are promoted to authority. The reason why I can have the confidence to declare, even in a room where no one responded and say, someone someday, somehow, you know what, it could be someone today, someone in this ministry who's not here today has a tight shoulder and as I said that, they were healed. I just dream of how many ways he can do it. The reason why I have the confidence to do that is because I've been conquered by his love. And perfect love casts out fear. So I don't fear your faces. I love you all. But even if you were screw facing me, I would, I would say it again. And I've been in churches where I've, I've started declaring stuff and they're facing like, Who's this guy? Get a load of this guy. He thinks he can feel stuff. <laughs> okay. Thus saith the Lord. Let's get to these questions. Let's get to these questions. Guys, thank you for being so responsive. We've got 20 odd minutes left. Um, a lot of these questions, kind of, to be honest, they do encapsulate one another. Um, so I'm going to try, do my best to kind of just um, I'll ask what I can. I'll, I'll read them out, obviously, and we'll go from there. 
the first question that actually came in was, you know, why does it feel at times that intimacy with God is stronger in, um, stronger in some seasons than other seasons? Now, not in a case of falling back into sin, but it just feels like God is not present. Yeah? It's a very, very, very great question. The first thing I would like to say on that is let's get away from the idea of seasons. Okay? In heaven, there are no seasons. There is only eternity. There is no time in heaven. So I personally have learned since 2017 to avoid seeing my life as seasons. All I need to know, the only time construct that God mentions is a day. The first day, the second day, the third day, and on the seventh day, he rested. So for me, it's, this is a personal thing, and I just maybe go and pray about it, but I don't necessarily co-sign going, oh, I'm in a season of, it's just today. I believe, because God knows us, and obviously Jesus having lived as a human being, he knows we only have enough for a day. That's why he sent man into the Israelites for the day. If you look through our scriptures, it's all like talk about enough for the day. Enough for the day. Get through today. If you only focus on today, do you know what tomorrow becomes? Today. Because at some point, you're going to wake up and tomorrow will become today. So if you only live focusing on your relationship with Jesus today, before you know it, you've done seven days, seven weeks, seven months, because you've just focused on the day you're in. Look, every time I've ever had a wobble, it's when I've tried to go, okay, well, what are you going to do about when I'm 40? Or what are you going to do about when I'm... And he says, just now. It's very interesting because I look back in the prophecies I got when I turned 30. I'm 35 now. God spoke to me on my 35th birthday. And it was the first, like, direct thing about the narrative of my life that he spoke to me. It took, like, years. He talks to me in decades, right? So he spoke to me when I turned 30. He said, here's the next 10 years. And then at 35, he gave me another word. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And for the first time since I was 30, I looked back at those words when I was 30, and they all matched up. But I hadn't lived my life going, when's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? And I realized I'm on a trajectory by 40 to match what he said at 30. But all I've done is focused on today. And in doing so, you then live your life feeling a lot closer to him than ever before. Because then you can't, there's no before and after, it's just the now. You understand? And also, let's also let's try to graduate ourselves from relying on feelings. Feelings are always superseded by truth. He's either close, closer than a brother or mother, father. He's either never leaves you or never, he either never leaves you or forsakes you. Or he's a liar. Which one is it? That's bigger than feelings. There, there are days, there are three days in a row, four days sometimes, where I do not feel like he is as close as he may feel now as I'm prophesying and, and we're in a moment of worship, whatever. It does not change the truth. And oftentimes, the way to reconnect with that feeling is to just declare the truth. And most times what I say to him, I say, Father, I do not feel like you are here, but I know you are. And in my honesty, he's there. It's one of the most powerful moments. Okay? Cool. We can move to the next one. What are practical day-to-day -day characteristics of being a friend of God? Hey, Charlie. My gosh. There are so many, but the two things I thought of when I saw this earlier this morning Conviction and ease, right? Conviction in the sense that I know that I know that I know that I know. You cannot convince me that I'm not close to him, that I'm face to face with my father. 
to the point, I remember even saying this, I was like, Lord, as I'm praying, I talk about you, I, I say my father. Like, over the years, it's changed from our father to my father. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to put people off. And I'm like, is that a bit arrogant? But it's because when you spend that much, I now realize why Christ in his converse with people would say, my father would say, my father, my father is, because you start to brag about the ones you know so close. So it's not from a point of arrogance, but from a point of conviction. So one of the daily characteristics of being a friend of God is learning to live from a place of conviction. That those scriptures you read are true. And then from that, you then go into a place of ease. In the sense that the things you used to work for, so working to pray in the morning, become easier. You want have, working to hear from him, no, it becomes easier. And those two aspects, conviction and ease, frame everything you do. So I could get into the nitty gritty of, oh, you do this, you do. Everything is framed by a place of conviction and a place of ease. Okay. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll want to pray more. You want to spend as much time with him. You will start moving your schedule around to make time for him because you're in love. Think about what anyone who's like madly in love does. That's a daily characteristic of a friend. Okay. Besotted. Absolutely besotted. And then you realize that he's even more besotted with you. How do you know when your relationship with God is transitioning into friendship? When you stop being performance-based in your rewards. When you realize that actually to receive, like the feedback I need to know that I'm doing well, is not anything to do about doing. I just need to be with him. As long as we're together, that's fine. Okay, it's like any relationship, and, and again, all the all the metrics are there. We see this in, in life. It's when speak to those in relationships, those who are maybe married. Those first few dates, you know, you're trying to do like not outdo each other, but like, uh, what can we do? Let's go to this new exhibition, or let's go to this new restaurant, and it gets that, and then you get to a point in your relationship where actually, let's just hang out. Because being together, at this point, it means more than just than, than doing the stuff. There were times when you know we were living in different cities when we first started dating Denise and I, and there were times where yeah we'd go out and do stuff, but also just spending time talking, talk for hours, and that was a highlight of the weekend. Or, you know, I think she even mentioned the other day about you might miss a train. You get, get the next train. Because we were talking. We were, you get caught up in the open return tickets. Thank you. <laughs> get the next train or get the next coach or whatever the case may be because you're in that moment. You don't mind spending that extra bit of money to get an Uber back from wherever you're coming from because I missed the last train, but I had such a great time with you. Lord, I was getting Uber to work today because what I just saw in the scripture, just I just want to spend a little, just 10 more minutes talking about this. Can you just explain me again about righteousness? Show me another scripture, Lord. So all those things that you see there, when, when you no longer view success based on performance, that's when you transitioned into friendship and what I realized from my own personal experience it didn't happen in every area it was like a you know like on the sound desk you know different failures like different areas of my life moved at different times because I've got to yield and there were some areas where there were some massive strongholds like fortified Game of Thrones type Dragonstone strongholds right full of defences, you had archers on the wall, and as soon as the Holy Spirit came near it, he was getting shot down. I didn't want to give him that area of my life. So there were some areas where I was so yielded to him, 
And we were in that friendship stage and other areas where it was like, don't even, don't even talk about that. Nope, not ready yet. Nope, don't touch that. And he just said, okay, I love you. And he went on the attack. And he sent wave after wave of love. <sighs> Until you battered down my walls. Because it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And when I encountered this love, this reckless love that overwhelms and chases me down, my archers put down their bow, my soldiers put down their swords. They beat their swords into plows and we began to harvest the reward of friendship. That's what happens. So it's not going to be every area. It's going to be, you know, you might be like, oh, oh gosh, I've got all this stuff to give him. He's patient and he knows. Be honest with him. Say, Lord, okay, I don't know how we're going to talk about that and, you know, that abuse or that this or that. All this stuff, I get it. But you can shift. And he will be patient enough to, to work with you. He knows you better than you know yourself. How much of abiding this love is practice and how much is faith accredited as abiding? Faith is a massive part of this because, again, you're not always going to feel that he's there. You're not always going to feel the same, you know, goosebumps and, you know, wave after wave of love and, whoa, Jesus, you're so amazing. Um, so again, that place of conviction, I know if the scripture says it, then it must be true. You said that Jesus prayed in John 17, he said that we are one. So we are one. I feel like rubbish to this morning. My mental health is in the bin. I'm stressed out, stretched out. Can't think up or down. But you said that we are one. I don't know how it works in this moment. Because I don't feel like how I felt yesterday at church. When Bim was leading worship and I was in that moment. And it was great. Fantastic song or whatever. I don't feel the same way. It's now Monday morning. I just, I'm just all over the place. But you said <laughs> that we are one. And then he reveals to you, yes, we can be one in those moments. Okay. And you practice being in those moments and not excluding him because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now we start learning that there was no secular versus sacred. Another lie that the church promoted for years. Okay, if you study the history of that secular versus sacred debate, it's from the old medieval times to dark ages when the church wanted to delegitimize creativity. So they said, if you weren't doing it for the church, you were secular. So it's got nothing to do with women for the devil or not. If a guy painted a picture of Jesus but he didn't give it to the church, they called it sec secular. What? That's the whole... It's ridiculous. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Lord, forgive us. So we have these internal debates with ourselves. We're like, because I'm my mental health, I'm feeling depressed right now. God can't be here because we made a line. With, That's not sacred. I call it Adam's delusion. I've got a whole sermon on it called Escaping Adam's Delusion. I think it's on Spotify. In a nutshell, because I know we've only got eight minutes. In a nutshell, what it is, is when Adam sinned, he, Adam believed that he was now, he couldn't have communion with God. But God still showed up for the walk, their daily walk. So it was a lie. Somehow Adam convinced himself that. But the father still showed up and said, Adam, where are you at? I'm here for... Now God knew what happened. But he still showed up. Oh, Dave, that's a bit... Uh, I'm not sure about that one. Oh, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. There was an, there's an aspect of God that we're yet to really hear preached in classical Western church where he comes and says, I know you're in the mud, but I'm going to stand here with my arm outstretched. 
It's called the gospel. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, the same way you received him, walk you in him. And we preach this stuff to sinners. You're in the mud. God's here. He's waiting for you. And as soon as they come in, we then start going, oh, well, you're in that. Well, that's actually, you know, he's out of that. And we put all these boxes in. No, no, he's like, I want it all. You're angry? Give me anger. Oh, I've screamed at him sometimes. Oh, I've been angry. I've thrown some stuff in his way. And he catches it and goes, okay. We'll talk about that when you're ready. You're schizophrenic? Throw it at him. Depressed? Throw it at him. Give him all. I dare you. Because you'll start to experience the love of God in all these different areas and the depression, because Isaiah 62, I think it talks about, Isaiah 61, 62, talks about this exchange. I will give you beauty for your ashes. The only way he can do that is if you give him your ashes. If you keep excluding him from your ashes, he can't, he can't give you beauty. Come on. If you keep the sickness to yourself, he can't give you healing. Like we know it logically, but yet we'll be depressed on Wednesday going, well, I can't pray. No, no, no. That's the, that is the time to pray because the love of God is, is abounding and saying, Hey, hey, I'm ready to, this is the moment where I'm going to prove to you that I'm face to face. I'm right here. There is no separation. For I never leave you nor forsake you. How do you get to know Jesus? How do you know you're close to him? And how do you know you're far from him? Well, how do you get to know Jesus? Let's just sum it up all in that. Ask him. That's what I did. I sat there and I said, come Lord Jesus, until he showed up. It sounds simple because it is. I do not want to give you any more on that. Because I feel like church has really made it into this super, super mystic thing of la di da di da I literally sat in my chair with this hunger to know him. And he knew I wanted to know him. And I said, come Lord Jesus. And at some point in that prayer time, I knew that he was there. And in that moment, and from that moment till now, I've never lost that moment. And I pray it all the time, come Lord Jesus. If I ever feel distant from him, if I ever feel distant from him, even though I know I'm not, but I'm still human, and I feel distant, I pray, I say, come Lord Jesus. Return me to that moment, December 23rd, 2017, when you showed up in my room. I could be anywhere in the world, and I pray that prayer. And he shows up in the same way. Three words, come Lord Jesus, that changed my life. And finally, after all those years in church, having preached, I'd already been preaching, I was healing the sick, I was traveling, I was touring, I'd done so many different things, I've recent albums, writing worship songs, I'd done all those things, all the metrics of a successful Christian boy. After all those things, I finally learned what it meant to be a friend and not a servant. And I transitioned into love. So yeah, just ask and he will show up. Did Paul not understand the friendship of Jesus along, alongside his lordship? Why? Because he calls himself a slave and a servant. Great question. A new one just come in 15 minutes ago. Someone's been studying their Bible. And it was a great question because, you know, we read them and go, oh, Paul, you're supposed to be the deep one. He calls himself a bond servant. If you study it out, it's when you voluntarily go into servitude. It's not slavery. In that sense, it's not the servant that Jesus was talking about where when Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant knows not what a master does. He was talking about that kind of slavery type where you are employed or you're put into my care and there's a distance. Bond servant is where linked arms are walking together and I have chosen to serve you. Like how you choose to serve in this house. I'm not forcing you to do it, but because of the love you have, for the vision and for the pastors, you serve. And that's the new context of servitude because obviously Peter still served the kingdom. So servanthood was placed in a new context 
And the context was friendship first, servant second. Okay? So that's what Paul understood. Paul understood that he was face to face with Jesus. And because of that, because of the being that he was, the doing came second. That's why if you read all of his letters, I've pretty much studied most of them in this kind of context. He opens up the first however many chapters are all about your being and the back end is about the doing. I'll show you from the book of Romans real quick. Romans 1, 2, 3, he talks about the depravity of man. He talks about how rubbish we are. <laughs> there is nothing within you that can ever match up all of you, all of us in before and short of the glory of God. Right? That's about our being. That's who we are. Goes into Romans 4, talks about Abraham and faith. Right? Starts to look at the inner workings of, of mankind and how we believe. Again, being. Right? Then he goes into um, 5 and he talks about grace. Right? He sets it up. We're going to come back to this. Sets up grace and talks about the duality between grace and sin. Right? And he says how sin has no comparison to the grace of God. Okay? He, it's important that he sets that up because in chapters 6 and 7, he talks about our being always falling into sin. And these cycles of sin, you know. Who said deliver me from this body of sin? He says that in chapters 6 and 7. Okay? Are you guys tracking with me? I'm just going too quick. You good? So he goes into 6 and 7, starts talking about the things I do, I don't even want to do anymore. I'm still making these mistakes. I'm still, you know, cussing out this person. I'm still cutting lanes, going through red lights. Come on, man. <sighs> still making these mistakes. The things I shouldn't be doing, I'm still doing, right? Like, and then he goes, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? But remember, but chapter five, he said that the grace of God is so far above the sinfulness and the downfall of man, there is no comparison. But he has to talk about the fact that we, there is still sin, that these things happen. That's chapter 6 and 7. Then 8, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So having looked at the fall of man and our sinful nature and these things that still occur even though we're saved, there is no condemnation. It talks about how you are a son, being, right? All of Romans 8, talking about sonship. All creation waits for manifestation of the Son of God. 9 and 10 and 11 talks about how you become saved. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Again, we're still talking about being, how you change yourself. Then in 12, he says, Now, in view of God's mercies, basically in view of everything I've been talking about, offer up yourself as a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable act to worship. He's changed. He's now not talking about do it being, now I'm talking about doing. And from that point on, 12 to 16, he's talking about doing. I, I read that one. Oh, Ephesians is the same. Where's he talking about the armor? It's at the back of the book. But at the beginning of the book, he talks about, do you not know that God loved you so much that he translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Being, 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 being. And then he tells you how to fight warfare. Because if I tell you how to fight before I tell you who you are, you're going to get killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Great question. Great question. It's and it's it's something that we all have to battle with. I know time is time is fun. Something we all have to battle with. I'm the same. Whether it's a day or three months. Yeah, oh I remember saying it to Denise when I said, I don't pray the same way I used to. 
There was a point every morning, six o'clock in the morning, I was downstairs praying an hour, two hours, however long it was. And then it shifted. And there was something different. And the enemy came, oh, that lasted a year and a half, but now you're... So are you really... And I was going out preaching all this stuff. And he, and he comes, but he's the accuser of the brethren. Again, what is truth? The only thing we have in our mouths is truth. When Jesus was tempted, when the accuser of the brethren came and accused Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, Jesus came back with truth. Right? It's the same way we need to be. The last thing Jesus had heard was, this is my beloved son and you're well pleased. What do you mean you're coming up to me and saying, if you are the son of God? Get me behind me, Satan. That's, it, it has to be that way. Right? And the more you practice doing that, not only the easier, I'm not saying the easier it becomes, but the more you begin to become aware of the enemy's devices. He gets sneakier and sneakier. Sometimes he used to show it to me almost blatant and be like, no, you're not that. Now he knows after this, what, 2017 to now, seven years, he can't come as bold as that. So if you come through a friend or you come through an Instagram post or you come through this, you'll have me comparing myself to this minister or this person. Oh, you ain't got your own this or you haven't got that. And I'm sitting there wrapped with doubt and questions. And I'm also like, oh, no, 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 no. And I just have to just declare it. And the more you do it, the more your tongue gets used to speaking in the same language of friendship. Because how do I know you transition into friendship? You start to finish each other's sentences. Every friendship group has their own little language. Look, think about your WhatsApp groups. It's things that you say in that group that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to say with your mum or dad or whatever. You think about a generation, a generation of a certain language that we use it, and you have to explain it to your parents. What's this word that you guys use? What? You have to explain it to them. Same way, me and the Father, we have these words that we use, it's in here, it's in the book. So when the enemy comes, I go to my group chat, what word do I have for that? And I just direct it back. And the more I do that, it sets it up. Yeah, and actually saying it out loud. Because words frame worlds from Hebrews 11.3. The atmosphere needs to hear it. Sometimes we like to do this as Christians. I say in my heart. <laughs> no, seriously, like, remember, like, seriously, spiritual warfare 101. He is the prince of the powers of the air and darkness. Speak it into his world. You just invaded my world with your foolishness. I want to come back to your world and I'm going to tell you what's what. Thus saith the Lord, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. There is absolutely nothing you can do to separate me from the love of my Father. For he has baptized me in his Holy Spirit, and I am now the temple of the Most High. So there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. He has taken your accusations and nailed them to a cross. The handwriting of ordinances against me have been nailed. And every sin and sickness and iniquity was laid upon his body that was broken on my body. It just comes out. But you have to practice it. Yeah? Yeah, personalize it. Put yourself in the scripture. Put yourself in the scripture. Oh, guys, you guys are throwing in questions left and right. Oh, my gosh, there's so many. Someone said about how do you, do you believe the very place you got hurt is the very place you have purpose? Sometimes it can be. What I do know is that all things work together for the good of those who love him. And that your story, there is no division. Everything can be used. Um, how does your lens, you view God's world, God's word and evolve? Um, yes, yeah, so reviewing Romans from a friendship lens. How does that evolution take place? Spending time with him. There are scriptures I read 10 years ago that I read them now and it's like, oh, wow. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that aspect because he is eternal. There is no, there's no way I will have all the revelation now. So I do not put that pressure on myself. 
I could come back here and preach the same scriptures in two years' time and we'll hear a different message. I'm okay with that. Cool. Because it's God. If, if he was finite, he wouldn't be God. So by default, I'm going to keep exploring. Why? Because deep calls out to deep. Being a very cause and effect person, uh, another one, I find that leaks into my relationship with the Lord. If I do, I'm great. If I don't, I'm not so. How do you work on that? Um, eternity. Eternity doesn't work by cause and effect. The only thing that works on is sow and reaping. Okay? That's the law in, 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 um, eternity. And also, God is not linear. Right? He said all things work together. <clears throat> which means you don't know which butterfly's wings cause the hurricane on the other side of the world. You don't know what trigger. There are decisions that are made here now that you, the reason why you didn't get that job now is because God wanted you in that job in five years' time. But you don't know that because you're not in five years' time. But he is. So just deal with today. It's not cause and effect. You just sow into your today. And then tomorrow, sow into your today. Sow into your today. Keep sowing and there'll be a harvest that comes along the way. Yeah? Um... I think that's how do you learn to honor your leader without falling into the trap of idol worship and people pleasing? Great question. <clears throat> do everything as unto the Lord. That's that, that'll be my answer. Because I, I understand, you know, sometimes, especially in a church like this where everyone's growing together, you know, you will see PA and, you know, PSA, they, they will expand into their calling and you'll be like, whoa. Because you remember them from when it was just 10 of us or 15 of us. How do you stop that being idol worship? Do everything I've done to the Lord. Let the Lord be your filter. By God, I'm, I'm going to go drop some food around. And he says, no, don't do it. Okay, next week, yeah, Lord, I want to drop some food around. Yeah, go do it. Why this week? Well, he knew that last week, the mindset you were in, it would have become an idol. This week, No. You don't even need to know the details. You just need to obey. Again, he's not linear. He doesn't go one plus one equals two. He goes provision. He goes, it's, it's crazy the things he does, right? He'll take this and take that and take that and he'll throw it in and call it. He just, he creates, right? So you just have to trust him. Because look what he created. He created us all. But like, he's good at this creative stuff. <laughs> right? He's so good, he can create a new man out of nothing. In the space of three hours on a cross outside Jerusalem, he created a whole new species of mankind and reset the DNA of humankind. Do you understand how deep that is? What took him a day with Adam took him three hours in Jesus. <laughs> Ephesians 4. Study it out. Um, I think that might be all of it. Guys, it's very important to, like I said, gather, to take stock of some of these things, these phrases, <coughs> these ideas that we have. If I didn't answer your question, if I've missed it, please forgive me. Um, the reason also why I want to say is because I know sometimes when we finish, people come up to me with some great questions. I'm like, oh, I wish I'd addressed that in, in, in the sermon or in, in the service. Um, I said this, I think it was to Leke, I think it was. I think one time I said this before. Um, I can't remember who wants to say it last time I was here. God created Adam on the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rested. Right? It was, it was years. So Adam's first day was God's day of rest. When Adam opened up his eyes, the Bible says that God breathed into Adam and he became alive. So when Adam opened up his eyes, the first thing he saw was the face of God. And the next day, was a day of rest. You never hear about that eighth day. You never hear about God going back to work. Why? 
because the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. There was no more work to be done. So from the time humankind was created, God had always created us to be in a relationship of rest. And rest equals faith and belief. You can only, and Hebrews 4 talks about this, let us labor that we may enter into his rest. It talks about how the Israelites, because of their unbelief, couldn't be in a position of rest. By default, it means that if you are in belief and faith, you're in a position of rest. What is that? It's total dependency on the Father. When you're in that place, you then enter into your day seven, which was always the plan. The plan was always, I will recreate you through Christ and salvation. I will breathe new life into you through the Holy Spirit. You will open your eyes, new creation. See me face to face. And the rest of your life is lived out from a position of rest. Ease, conviction, knowing that I know that I know that my Father has taken care of every single thing I need. So whatever comes our way, whatever struggle we may face, whatever problem may arise, whatever story is yet to be told, the highest calling of our life is to be called son, daughter, friend. And the challenge of life is to look at the struggles, to look at the challenges, the problems, and to, as we spoke about earlier, use the word of God to dare life to match up to truth. And when it does, you will begin to walk in what Romans 5 talks about, ruling and reigning in life that you may exercise the authority of the kingdom here on earth. This is why I call it the highest calling. Because God always wanted us to rule and reign here on earth. It was not for us to be below. It's not from the point of arrogance. It's just God's children were always called to rule and reign. And so we live as priests before God, taking the affairs of man to him. And we live as kings before men, taking the affairs of God to them, the kingdom of priests. That's what it says in the scripture, Revelation 5, if, if Exodus 19, the kingdom of priests. I'll say it again, we live as priests before men, taking their affairs and saying, Father, this is what our nation needs. This is what my family needs. This is what my sister needs. <coughs> But we live as kings before men, saying, this is what the heart of the Father is. Be thou healed, be thou saved, be thou restored. The kingdom of priests. David, the beloved, he understood it. That's why underneath his kingly garments, he had a priest's effort. No other king in the history of Israel exhibited both things. And that's why Jesus was called the son of David. Because through Christ, we now could be a kingdom of priests. And every single one of us have been called to this highest calling, to be kings and priests on the earth. But to do that, you must learn to be a friend, to stay close, face to face, in your day seven. Can we stand? Jesus, we give you praise, we give you glory. We thank you for the revelation of your heart. And your desire to be friend. You are Lord, you are Savior. And you also call us friend. That all these things can be true. And if we would dare to be a people who would engage with all these facets of our salvation, we would then step into our calling that you describe in Revelation, that we might be a kingdom of priests purchased by your blood. 
to exercise the authority of heaven over here in earth. That all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's what you've always wanted, Father. Father, transform our hearts to be your playground. That we may find the adventure of relationship with you. Do away with all condemnation. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come against every spirit of rejection that has had its tentacles in any individual in this place right now. Those who have struggled to access your love because they were rejected before. Father, we cancel it right now in the name of Jesus. Those who have lived under words that have capped their experience of love and therefore cause them to struggle to accept that you love them unconditionally. We cancel it right now in the name of Jesus. And we release our brothers and sisters into the freedom of the truth that they are loved unconditionally by you, Jesus. Father, we position ourselves both at the foot of the cross and in the glory of the empty tomb that we might know that we know that we know that you are for us, you are with us, and that life from this point on will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning into today's session. I am sure you were encouraged, you were edified, you were convicted, you were all types of things that led you to being edified in Christ. I want to also just give you the opportunity if you've been blessed in any way to help support the ministry through giving. Um, this would be a perfect time for you just to, you know, water the, the plant that's been feeding you some good word in the season of your life. So I want to bless you and thank you in advance in supporting us and also invite you to follow us on all things social and new thing London, London being LDS. I look forward to seeing you on the journey.